The next few moments are devoted to silent prayer. That gives each of you as a believer priest the privacy of your priesthood to rebound if necessary. For if we name our sins to God, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all wrongdoing. When we name our sins to God, we are filled with God the Holy Spirit. God the Holy Spirit is our mentor and our teacher and the one who brings to our memory those things we have forgotten. So with that in mind, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and freedom to assemble ourselves together for the purpose of learning the Word of God. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us and give us the concentration necessary to assimilate this portion of the Word of God into our stream of consciousness. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. We're studying the doctrine of giving as related to our study in Acts, in which they had everything in common, simply meaning that those who were willing to give, gave all to the church. Now this does not necessarily mean that you should give all to the church, and this is what we will study in the doctrine of giving. First of all, giving is an expression of worship to commemorate the grace policy of God. Giving in the church age is the legitimate function of the believer's royal priesthood in worship, both inside and outside of the local church, such as you could give for hospitality. Giving is one of the four categories of Christian service. First of all, there is Christian service related to your spiritual gift. Secondly, and I'll go over these quickly because we've already studied them, and we will continue to uh, wrap it up today. Secondly, Christian service related to your royal priesthood, and that includes prayer, giving, the execution of the protocol plan of God through learning, thinking, and solving. Number three, Christian service related to your royal ambassadorship, and that includes evangelism, witnessing, administration in the local church, function on the mission field, and in function in any type of Christian service organization. Number four, Christian service related to the laws of divine establishment, and they include serving in the military, serving in law enforcement, government, but of course never activism. And we may have a lot of trouble during these, during these times of an election year of activism. Activism is not pertinent. Activism is not allowed under the protocol plan of God. So stay away from activism. It's not going to change a thing. You're trying to whitewash the devil's world. And we are in trouble as a country, but activism isn't going to save it. Activism will only hurt this country. So stop being a, a person who is hurtful toward the country and join us in the protocol plan of God. Giving is the presentation of money or other valuable commodities which may be used in the sustaining of the Ministry of Doctrinal Communication. Giving is for the sustaining of doctrinal communication. And these gifts do not pertain to things like building funds, or to dog and pony shows, or anything that relates to uh, you trying to bring people in through uh, certain types of activities related to dog and pony shows. You don't go to church to be entertained. That's a principle. You don't go to church to be entertained. I'm not entertaining, and you're not here to be entertained. Could I be entertaining? Yes. I play the violin. I could entertain you. I could pull out the guitar and start to play and 
show you some of the new tunes that I've learned, I could do that as well. Now, that's not wrong in the sense of I could never do it for you because I may at some point at the beginning of a service, but it has nothing to do with you being here. The reason why you should be here is to learn Bible doctrine. And you're probably wondering, what new tune do I know on the guitar? Quite a few, actually. The guitar is an interesting instrument, and um, it's really related to chords. And it's probably one of the easiest of instruments, because when you play a chord, you can then go ahead and sing along with it, if you have any type of uh, ear related to it. But other than that, uh, just say to yourself, Christian service is not related to that. I could, if I got up here and played the guitar for an hour, that would not be of any benefit to you except for entertainment. And guess what? It's not about entertainment. You don't go to church to be entertained. And I have a lot of talents that would relate to entertainment, but I'm not going to show them or show them off that often because you're not here to be entertained. I could have started off by playing the violin. I would have practiced beforehand, of course, because it's been a while, but I could have started off by playing the violin and a lot more people would be interested, but that's not why you're here. Christian giving may be extended to organizations other than the local church, of course. You could give to a missionary organization such as Grace Evangelistic Ministries, which is run by Moses on Wabiko. You could give to a Bible school. You could give to the radio, such as having me blasted out over the radio or any pastor teacher who's teaching doctrine blasted over the radio or to any mp3 ministry. Giving is designed, but this is the principle, giving is designed to support communication gifts. Giving is the means of inculcation or inculcating teamwork and coordination into the body of Christ. Once again, giving is the means of inculcating teamwork and coordination into the body of Christ. The greatest thing that when it comes to giving, the greatest thing is motivation. Your motivation. If your motivation is wrong, don't give. So motivation is key. And you can write that down as a principle. Motivation is key. The motivation in giving. Principle one. Motivation is the major issue in giving, not the amount given. You could give a dollar, and if your motivation is 100% behind it, you've done right. You could give a million dollars, and if your motivation is not behind it, you're wrong! And you're so wrong, you could die the sin face to face with death. This is serious business. Motivation is the major issue in giving, not the amount given. Principle 2. Principle 2 comes from 2 Corinthians 9 7. And if you can flip there quick enough, 2 Corinthians 9 7 states, Each person. To the degree he has determined by means of his thinking his right lobe, so give, not from distress of mind or compulsion of emotions, for God loves a grace-oriented giver. Once again, 2 Corinthians 9, 7, each person, to the degree he has determined by means of his right lobe, his thinking, so give not from distress of mind or compulsion of emotions, for God loves a grace-oriented giver. 
You give based on the metabolized Bible doctrine in your soul, not on the basis of emotion. Just because somebody can rile you up emotionally doesn't mean you should give. And there are a lot of good, fast talkers who can get you to give money when you should not. You give based on the metabolized Bible doctrine on your, in your soul, not on the basis of your emotions. God provides and enjoys the mental attitude that accompanies giving. God loves the mental attitude of giving. That's all documented in scripture which we'll note. God loves the mental attitude of giving. God loves the giver. Why? Because God's a giver. You ever thought about it? God's given you everything. And if God's given you everything and that's who he is, why would he not like a giver? He does. He loves the giver. So giving is the means of inculcated teamwork and coordination into the body of Christ. And the motivation in giving is as follows. Motivation is the major issue in giving and not the amount that is given. Look at 2 Corinthians 9, 7. Each person, to the degree he has determined by means of his right lobe, so give, not from distress of mind or compulsion of emotion, for God loves a grace-oriented giver. I realize I just gave that. I did it to reinforce it. You give based on the metabolized Bible doctrine in your soul, not on the basis of emotion. And God provides and enjoys the mental attitude and the, those that accompany in giving. God loves grace-oriented giving. Don't give emotionally. I could rile you up emotionally. But don't give emotionally. Don't give impulsively. I could rile you up that way. You might say, well, how could you do that? How, how in the world could you do that? Well, all right. I could give you an example. I might as well. It's not uh, too difficult for me to do so. Let me tell you. Our country is in need. Our country is falling apart. Our country needs to have the Word of God pressed throughout all 50 states. And right now I have the Word of God going to California and upstate New York and Florida and we need the Word of God in all 50 states. And right now I've labored and made about 100 CDs that are up there ready to be distributed. But we need more than 100. We need more than 100. After all, it's our country we're talking about. And our country is falling apart. So what should we do? You need to give me money so that I can spread this around and I can give and spread the gospel from here to there and that is what God has called me to do and God has laid it on my heart today amen God has laid it on my heart today to get to for you to raise for me fifteen hundred dollars so that I can start sending money or start sending gifts what are you pointing at I'm not unplugged. I'm plugged into the Word of God. What are you talking about? No, just the thing fell off. But you get the point. I could make an emotional plea for money right now, and, and the emotional plea would be wrong. And that is not what I was doing, by the way. Some of you might have got excited and said, Oh my goodness, I'm about to send you money. Don't. <laughs> I, 
I'm going to send these things out as the Lord wants, when the Lord wants, and with whatever little bit of money I have. Now, if you want to give without emotion, that's up to you later, after the message. Not right now. Not with me trying to rile you up and trying to get you to think, oh, well, I better give or the country's over. Well, the country's over, probably, but it doesn't have to do with you giving, I can tell you that. So we have the motivation in giving. And the motivation, it has to do with not the amount given. That's not the major issue. Second Corinthians 9, 7, each person to the degree he is determined by means of his right lobe, so give, not from distress of mind or compulsion of emotions, for God loves a grace-oriented giver. 2 Corinthians 9, 8 states, And God is able to make all grace abound to you, that always having all sufficiency, all sufficiency in everything, you may have an abundance for every good deed. A good deed would be me teaching the word of God. So God graciously provides extra finances for grace givers to give. Now there are those who actually have the gift of giving or the gift of helps. And God always provides an abundance for them. But the only legitimate system of giving is a grace giver giving to a grace cause. My cause is a grace cause. And if you're a grace giver, you can give what you wish but I'm never going to beg for it. For a cattle on a thousand hills are his, not yours and not mine. We always have to keep it into perspective. God graciously provides extra finances for grace givers to give. The only legitimate system of giving is a grace giver giving to a grace cause. 2 Corinthians 9.9 9 states, and this is a quotation from Psalms 112.9. Just as it stands written, He scatters abroad, He gave it to the poor, His righteousness abides forever. His, he scatters abroad means that God gives money to certain people, both rich and poor. God's grace righteousness meets at the point of grace giving. You know, if you ever receive something from someone, thank God. You can thank the person as well. I mean, that's polite. But thank God, because that's where it's really coming from. And if you're one of these people who has the gift of giving, or the gift of helps which relates to the gift of giving, don't ever ex uh, expect a thank you. You'll probably get one. But if you don't get one, don't feel bad because guess what? All the thanks goes to God. And someone may thank you, someone may not. Some people have a problem saying thanks. And it just has to do with their personality. My pastor always said he had a problem saying thanks. At times in my life, I've had a problem saying thanks. I don't have the problem saying thanks anymore. If uh, something, I'll, I'll say thanks very quickly. Because it's a part of protocol, really. But still, even if no one says thanks, what you give is from God. And so really, who you should thank is God. Both the giver and... And the receiver thanks God. And that's what it has. You don't have to worry about. If you start worrying about what people are going to say, then you fall into approbation lust, and it just uh, destroys the whole situation. It destroys the whole spiritual life. God graciously provides extra finances for grace givers to give. And the only legitimate system of giving is a grace giver giving to a grace cause. 
I have a grace cause. If someone wants to grace give, they can. 2 Corinthians 9, 9, just as it stands written, He scatters abroad, He gave it to the poor, His righteousness abides forever. He scatters abroad means that God gives money to certain people, both rich and poor, and God's grace righteousness meets at the point of grace giving. Then in 2 Corinthians 9, 10, Now he who supplies seed to the sower, that's capital, Seed to the sower. Seed is capital. Now he who provides seed to the sower, capital, and bread for food, he will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. What this means is that God supplies and gives extra money to grace givers. Once again, there's the principle. God supplies and gives extra money to grace givers those with the gift of helps, those with the gift of grace. I don't have that gift because I don't have any money. (laughs) But some people do. God supplies and gives extra money to grace. My gift is pastor, teacher. And oftentimes the poorest people in the world are pastor, teachers. All you have to do is ask the Apostle Paul. As a result, there is an increase in the harvest of your Christian service. Your Christian service, when you are in, when you are a grace giver, when you are one of those who has the gift of helps, that is part of your Christian service. It's marvelous because it coordinates it together. I would be nothing. I wouldn't even be able to speak if it weren't for finances supporting me to speak and it does cost something for me to get up here and speak and to have a website I would be nothing I couldn't speak now I have the gift of pastor teacher but I need other people I need them and that all relates to the body of Christ I need other people I need to have internet access in order to speak and to get it out there to those who listen, which I don't know how many, but people listen. 2 Corinthians 9, 11 through 12. You will be made rich in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will will result in thanksgiving to God. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of God's people, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanksgiving to God. See there? When people receive something, they thank God for it. They may never thank you, but they thank God for it, and that's the point. Giving is a mental attitude based upon the problem-solving device called grace orientation, and grace orientation is the basis for grace giving. If you don't have grace orientation, don't give. Otherwise, you'll be giving grudgingly. Giving is an expression of the royal family honor code principle. Giving is an expression of the royal family honor code. Turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 16, verse 26. Romans chapter 16, verse 26. As you turn there, I almost have an urge to beg for money and do the emotional type activity, just as an example, although I already did so. I almost want to do it again. Our country is falling apart. We're about to go under the fifth cycle of discipline. I've given a gospel message that is going to go out and go all around Ohio. I've created 100 of these CDs by myself but I don't have the money or the resources to produce anymore. And I would like for these CDs to go throughout all the country. 
I would like to have them mailed here, there, and everywhere. But see, that takes more money than I have. So then I would go on and uh, basically dun you for money, which would be evil and wrong. And I only did that just so you could have time to get to Romans 16, 26. For, Mesa, for, for, for Macedonia and Achaia have decided with pleasure to make a special offering to the poor believers who are in Jerusalem. Now at this point, there was a Jerusalem church and they were poor. Why were they poor? They were under the third and fourth cycles of discipline. But churches outside of Jerusalem decided to make, and with pleasure, notice, with pleasure, they gave the money, with pleasure. If When you give money, when you give money, if you're not giving it with pleasure, don't do it. Is that correct? Romans 16, 26. Is that not what it says for Mesa, Macedonia and Achaia? Well, let's make it known to all nations that you should give in such a manner. I don't know what happened there, but let's go on. Turn to Galatians 2.10. Let's see if this is correct. Galatians 2.10 They only asked us to remember the poor, the very thing I was also eager to do. Galatians 2.10 They only asked us to remember the poor, the very thing I was eager to do. Notice, you have to be eager to do it. Eager! Motivation. Now, if you say to yourself, Nah, I don't have that money this month. That doesn't make you wrong. Now, I said it in a way that sounds like you're a mean person, like you're a Scrooge, but you're not. Maybe you have to provide for your own family. Maybe you have some bills you have to pay yourself. That's understandable. And frankly, it's understandable if you want to keep 100% of your money. So if you say, nah, I don't want to give. I got a lot of things I need to do. That's understandable. And it doesn't make you less of a Christian. How about that? Bet you've never heard that before except from Colonel Thame. Doesn't make you less of a Christian. You can be in play Roma and say, no, I don't have the money to give right now. And you can say it that strongly. And guess what? You're still a play Roma believer. It has to do with motivation. And if you're eager to give, well then give. Now it is true that as you grow spiritually, some of that eagerness increases. Charity is from God. That is, when you decide to give and you are eager to give, it's from God. Charity is from God. Socialism and welfare are from man and evil. I remember when I went to, uh, well, I went to a place in North Carolina, in the mountains of North Carolina, in Brevard, to a uh, music school. And I was all squared away in Bible doctrine and all squared away with reference to how socialism is bad and capitalism is good, but... Uh, my contemporaries were not, not at all. I was rejected, oftentimes by most people, not by all. I even found a little girlfriend, she didn't care. So, uh, I had fun there. But nonetheless, there was uh, a lot of people who rejected me. 
because I said socialism is wrong. Socialism is wrong. And I knew it was wrong and they did not know that. Well, that's just a little bit of history of me. So let's continue. Charity is from God. And that is what I told them. Because they would always say, well, don't you want to give to the poor? And I said, well, through charity, yes, of course. And then they would say, and then I would say, but through government, it's forced. It's forced. And we are a country of freedom. And we don't have a, we should not have it to where it's forced to where we're giving. But that's the way it works. Now, welfare is from man. Charity is from God. So giving is an expression of free will without gimmicks, without coercion. That girlfriend, by the way, was from Ohio. I just now remembered her. <laughs> she was a strange one, though, so don't... <laughs> Second Corinthians 8, 3. Now, don't think anything weird happened. That's the way, you know what? The way some people think, they always think in terms of... Uh, I won't even go there. I was 15 years old. Nothing, nothing strange happened. Second Corinthians 8, 3. 2 Corinthians 8.3 states, I testify on the basis of their ability and beyond their ability they gave willingly. This is the Apostle Paul talking about another church. Because the Corinthians, <laughs> the Corinthian people, they didn't like to give anything. They were rich, but they didn't like to give money. But he had to tell them, I testify on the basis of their ability and beyond their ability, they gave willingly. Now, when people give, oftentimes that is a sign of their spiritual growth, for giving is an expression of mental attitude in every circumstance in life. I remember when I met Moses on Wabiko, well, I had met him before, but... I met him once again at the Atlanta conference. He was there and I was there. And I happened to have, uh, they happened to uh, suit us together in the same room. And uh, he was talking to me about uh, Colonel Theme and what he had done for him. And he said, you know, Colonel Theme gives me $400 a month. And he said, I went down and I tried to thank him for it, but he would have no part of it. He said, don't thank me, and this is the quote, quotation, he said, don't thank me for what I give to you because what you are doing is far greater than what I do. Now that's humility. That is some serious humility. And what he meant was, it is far greater to win souls. You see, the gift of Moses on Wabiko's missionary to go out and win souls. And if someone goes to heaven, well, that's fantastic. If they're winner or loser, so what? Now, the job of Colonel Theme is to make you a winner. I hope you understand what I'm saying. The colonel knew what he was saying. He was saying, my job is I teach Christians, and if they are winners, and if they become winners, then that's great. But your job's even greater than mine because you are winning souls to Christ. And it doesn't matter if they're winner or loser, they're going to go to heaven instead of hell. And that is greater, isn't it? Yes, it is. And he said, don't you ever... Thank me again for this. And that was the end of that. <laughs> but he was kind to him. He was just saying, don't thank me for it. <clears throat> and that's part of giving. That's part of the coordination of giving and the coordination of having the church. The coordination of the church, the body of Christ. So even though under adversity, 
They all shared the happiness of God. Let's look at 2 Corinthians 8.2. 2 Corinthians 8.2. I'll give you a little bit of time to look at it. 2 Corinthians 8 2. That in the midst of severe testing and great pressure, the superabundance of their happiness and their deep poverty overflowed in rich generosity. Once again, 2 Corinthians 8 2. Then that in the midst of severe testing and great pressure, the superabundance of their happiness and their deep poverty overflowed in rich generosity. So even though under great adversity they shared the happiness of God and having that mental attitude, they gave even while in deep poverty. Once again, even though under adversity they shared the happiness of God and having that mental attitude, they gave even while they were in deep poverty. Giving must express an attitude toward the Lord before it can express an attitude toward others. This is something you should write down as a principle because it will keep you from having approbation lust. Giving must express an attitude toward the Lord before it can express an attitude toward others. Your motivation comes from the Lord. You're not motivated because you want someone to like you, in other words. So again, the principle, giving must express an attitude toward the Lord before it can express an attitude toward others. Your attitude toward the Lord has to be right first. Then everything else falls into place easily. Always has, always will. 2 Corinthians 8.5 Let's look at 2 Corinthians 8.5 It's just one flip from Actually you shouldn't even have to flip it Just scroll down 2 Corinthians 8.5 And not even as we anticipated But they gave first of themselves to the Lord Then they gave to us by the will of God what does this mean? It means they were occupied with Christ and had a personal love for God the Father and that was the motivation for their giving. They were occupied with Christ and had a personal love for God the Father which was a motivation for their giving. Giving depends on consistent post-salvation epistemological rehabilitation. That's a principle. Giving depends upon post-salvation epistemological rehabilitation. The more doctrine you have, the more capacity you have for giving. And the more you know when it is right to give and when it is not a time to give, because there's a time to give, and there's a time when you shouldn't give. If it's going to hurt your family, if it's going to hurt your finances in such a way that you're going to fret about it, don't give. Don't give at all. When you give, it should be with a smile on your face. Oftentimes people will see, if they might see that you just tossed over a hundred dollar bill and say well that was good I did that before one I when I went to a uh, conference in Atlanta Georgia I had I I at the time I was working at a machine shop and I lived at home so I didn't really have that much in terms of uh, keeping up a family or anything I didn't have any of that so I just tossed a hundred 
hundred bucks in the thing gleefully. That was when the colonel came to Atlanta so that he could come next time. And, uh, and uh, I think my father got bug-eyed and said, wow, that's good. But no, not really. If it, it is good. If I had tossed a dollar in there and he got bug-eyed and said, that's good, then that would be something too, right? <laughs> but that's what it means. If I had given a dollar... And that is what I wanted to give, and I had set in my soul that this is what I'm giving, then that's just as good. But I wanted to give a hundred. That's what I set in my soul, so I gave a hundred, flopped it right in there. So what? But the amount doesn't matter, you see. That's the principle. Giving is associated with impersonal love not with personal love, and that's why it's grace-giving. Now let's see. Let's look at 2 Corinthians 8, 7. But just as you excel in everything, in faith rest and in doctrine, and in knowledge and in all diligence, and in love from you to us, you also excel in this grace-giving. So once again we have giving called out as being grace giving is associated with grace it's associated with impersonal love and that is grace giving precedence for giving is derived from the dispensation of the hypostatic union and it is predicated upon grace after grace you see after all Jesus Christ did all for us that he could ever do. He died as a substitute for us on the cross. There is nothing greater that he could have done. And so when we give in grace, it's fantastic. It's a reflection of what he did on the cross, but in a smaller way, of course. 2 Corinthians 8, 9 Take a look at 2 Corinthians 8, 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, that is, he was eternal God. You can't get richer than that, can you? Let's take a look at this. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, eternal God, can't get richer than eternal God, Yet for your sake he became poor. That means he became true humanity. So that through his poverty, his poverty means that he was judged for our sins. Through his poverty, we might become rich. A socialist would never understand this passage. 2 Corinthians 8, 9, For you know that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, he was eternal God, yet for your sake he became poor. He came out of the splendor of heaven. There's songs about that and hymns about that, by the way. I love that song about how he came from the splendor of heaven. And he came down from the splendor of heaven and he became poor. He became a man. And not only that, he was judged as a substitute on the cross for our sins, in which he cried out, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, my, why have you forsaken me? Because he was being forsaken for you and for me, because through his wealth, and through, that is, through his poverty of being judged on the cross, we've become rich. We're rich. I don't care what you have in your bank account. We are all rich as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. So giving is a mental attitude. First of all, giving is a mental attitude. Then it can be related to an overt act. But giving is a mental attitude. And if you don't have the mental attitude, don't do it. 2 Corinthians 
Look at 2 Corinthians 8, 12. For if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable on the basis of what one has, not on the basis of what one does not have. What does that mean? You want to know what that means? Willingness counts for giving even if you have nothing to give and I love that. Oh, do I ever love that because I'm willing to give so much but I don't have a dime. Willingness counts for giving even if you have nothing to give. That's what it means. And that makes me happy. So I don't have a dime to give, but I want to give millions. And you know, you want to know something? When I think in my soul, I don't have nothing, but I want to give millions, it counts. God counts it. Cha-cha-ching, cha-cha-ching. No, you don't have it, but cha-cha-ching, cha-ching, I know you would. I would give, but I don't have. And a lot of people are in that situation. They want to give, but they don't have. I hear people, I talk to people online who want to give to this ministry, but they don't have. And I say, don't worry about it. It counts anyway. And that's exactly what I've told them. And I said, I don't really want you to give anyway. But sometimes people come up with a willingness and they really do have a willingness. And I will very gently say, don't worry about it. It counts anyway. And now uh, forget about ever giving here. I don't want it. You don't have it. I don't want it. So giving is related to motivation from metabolized doctrine in the right lobe of the soul. And a lot of people are wanting to give today but they can't because of the economic circumstances we live in under the third cycle of discipline. 2 Corinthians 9, 7 Each one, as he has determined in his right lobe, so give, not from distress of mind or, for, or under compulsion of pressure or emotions, for God loves a gracious giver. 2 Corinthians 9, 8 and God is able to make all grace abound to you, that in always having all sufficiency in everything, you may have abundance for every good deed. And that verse is for the one who has that special gift of helps and grace giving. Second Corinthians 9.10 Now he who supplies seed for the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. But all of this has to do with generos generosity of mental attitude. Generosity of mental attitude, a attitude results in generosity of giving, such as in 2 Corinthians 9.11. You will be made rich in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion, and through us your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. In other words, Giving is never a strain for those who have that gift of giving. Giving is never a strain. And even for those who don't have the gift, if you want to give, it should never be a strain. If you give and it is a strain on you, don't! And I, don't, and I mean a strain on you mentally. Or if you would feel guilty for giving. Or if you would feel like you should have used that money for something else. Don't give. If you think in those terms, don't give. And oftentimes you're right to think in those terms. You aren't to feel guilty about it. Sometimes you have a family to keep up, etc. And you just don't have the money. Don't feel guilty about that. Just don't give. And don't feel guilty about it at all. Ever. Guilt is a sin. So if you think it is strained, don't give. Giving is a result of Christian service. 2 Corinthians 9.12 2 Corinthians 9.12 
For this service which you perform is not only supplying the needs of God's people, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanksgivings to God. Do you know that when you give the proper way, that it, it, that it results in a lot of thanksgiving to God? A lot of people will go into prayer and they will thank God for what they have received. They may never thank you, but they'll thank God, and that's tremendous, because it's all from God anyway. After all, the cattle on a thousand hills are his, are they not? Yes, they are. That's what I have on my website. The cattle on a thousand hills are his. That's why I don't ask for money. That's why I don't get any money. <laughs> But I don't care. I have enough to keep the ministry going. That's fine enough. Money's not an issue to me. So giving is a result of Christian service, 2 Corinthians 9.12. So the principle of giving is related to two spiritual gifts. What I Here we go. Now let's take some principles. The principle of giving is related to two spiritual gifts. First, pastor-teacher. Second, evangelism. First of all, the pastor must make an issue out of, the, out of two things as a recipient of the support from believers. He must make an issue out of the gospel, and he must make an issue out of what is the Christian way of life after salvation. Why does he have to make an issue of the gospel? Because the pastor teacher is to also be one who gives the gospel as well. And that's because of the failure of evangelism, uh, period. That's why. It's because of the failure of evangelism. So the pastor must make an issue out of two things, the gospel and the Christian way of life. And if you're making an issue out of the gospel and Bible doctrine, then you cannot make an issue out of money. And you will never, ever, ever, ever hear me make an issue out of money. Now, I've been, I have uh, known of a lot of people who have come out of Baraka Church, and I've followed them not, not closely. I'm not a spy, but I've seen and have heard of from various sources where they start making an issue out of money. You can't make an issue out of money and do your job. I have to make an issue out of Christ and Bible doctrine, not money. I'm not a salesman. You have to make the issue out of Bible, out of the gospel and Bible doctrine, not money. And it makes me sick and bilious when I see pastors do so because they don't have any idea what the Christian way of life is. If you ever see a pastor making an issue out of money, then he's an idiot. He doesn't know the Christian way of life. He probably doesn't even know the gospel. Makes me sick. That's one of my pet peeves. To see a pastor begging for money. That's one of my pet peeves. I despise it. Vitriolic despise. I mean, I really, if there's anything I hate, that's what I hate. You say, well, you don't hate someone going to the bar more? No, I love them. I hate those. <laughs> who are talking about trying to get money. At least the person going to the bar is just being honest. They're going to the bar to get a drink. But the, per but the pastor who's out trying to raise money, that's not his job! It also makes me sick because of experiences that I've had in my youth of seeing such dastardly activity. The pastor must make an issue out of the gospel and Bible doctrine. 
The pastor must never make an issue out of money. 2 Corinthians 11, 7 through 9. Because I preached the gospel of God to you without charge. Now this is the Apostle Paul using a bit of sarcasm. 2 Corinthians 11, 7 through 9. Because I preached the gospel of God to you without charge. I robbed other churches taking wages from them to serve you and when i was present with you and and when when i was present with you and was in need i was not a burden to anyone for when the brethren came from macedonia they fully supplied my need in everything and i kept myself from being a burden to you and will continue to do so in other words, the Apostle Paul never had to beg for money, and he would not. You know what he would do? <clears throat> when he was low on money, what did he do? He worked with his own two hands. He made tents. I love the Apostle Paul. Can't wait to meet him in heaven. Because he knew enough not to beg. He was never a beggared. Most preachers today are beggars. And if God would allow it, I would slap all their faces, but he doesn't, of course. I'm just giving you the idea. Now, Paul was supported by other churches at this time. He was supported by the Ephesians. He was supported by the Philippians. And he was also, while he was in Corinth, the Corinthians, they weren't giving anything to Paul. The Corinthians had a, a rough time often. They really weren't that interested in the unique spiritual life. But Paul went there anyway and was supported by other churches. Now the function of the board of deacons is to make the issues clear that pertain to the economic survival of a local church. Uh, they make that clear, but nowadays when we have the internet and everything else, it, it, it takes very little to run a church. Very little money right here in the United States of America. God bless it, it takes very little money to run a church. If you want to learn Bible doctrine, you can learn it. You can just sign online and learn it, and it costs very little. I don't need, the, now of course you say, well a pastor needs money to uh, study and teach to where he doesn't have to work, and that's true, but uh, that oftentimes can't be accommodated. But Paul was supported by other churches, and the pastor-teacher exchanges spiritual blessings to the congregation, for material blessings from the congregation principle. The pastor-teacher exchanges spiritual blessings to the congregation for material blessings from the congregation. And this fulfills the principle of mutual blessing by association. Philippians 1 3 and 1 5. I am giving thanks to God for every memory of you because of your contribution from the first day until now for the purpose of spreading the gospel. The Philippians gave a lot of money to the Apostle Paul and he used it in the proper manner by giving the doctrine. Giving reflects the mental attitude of the congregation toward their pastor teacher. Philippians 4.10 I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last you have revived your concern for me. Indeed, you have been concerned, but you lacked opportunity to give. They were concerned. They did lack an opportunity to give, but finally did. So giving establishes a partnership between the pastor and the congregation. Giving establishes a partnership between the pastor and the congregation. 
And I've had people give to me by whatever means necessary that they could give, uh, whatever amount of money they could give. And I've had people give to me in the form of cookies. And that's wonderful. It makes me smile. It was done out of love. I give Bible doctrine, I get a cookie. I liked it. See? So giving establishes a partnership. I give Bible doctrine, I get a cookie and a big belly. <laughs> Can't eat cookies anymore. Man, would I like to, though. But I can't. I want a honey bun and everything else. Just can't do it. But giving establishes a partnership between the pastor and the congregation. The congregation provides a financial contribution as they are spiritually blessed by the pastor's teaching. So we have finally, and since this is our final verse, you might as well turn there, Philippians 14.14. 14. Philippians 14.14 14. Then we'll close it up and we'll be about an hour long exactly. There is no Philippians 14. Well here let me read you something anyway. <laughs> However, when you shared by giving and became partners with me in my adversity, you functioned honorably. Is it 414? Philippians 414, however, when you shared by giving and became partners with me in my adversity, you functioned honorably. And to function honorably simply means and to function honorably in giving simply means that you give when you're motivated to give. If you're not motivated, don't give. If you have other things that you need to take care of and it bothers you to give at that time, don't give at that time. That's not honoring the Lord. There'll come a time when you will have the ability to give, when you will have the money, when you'll have that time to just flop that $100 right over. I've had that ability on very few occasions, but I've had the ability. And I never gave more than, I didn't regret it walking out. I didn't even think about it, really. Just flopped down the $100, walked out. Never even thought about it. And uh, the amount you give isn't even the issue. And there have been other times when I've flopped down less. Now I flop down nothing. <laughs> and I don't care. I don't have anything to give, so I don't give. But when the Lord blesses me to have something to give, I will give. But I'm not worried about it. Neither should you be. And you should not be worried about giving to any congregation, not even to me, not to anyone. You shouldn't be worried about it. And it, it should all come from your soul, what you should do. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity of coming to understand what giving is all about. And now unto him who is able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before the presence of his, of his glory with exceeding joy, to the only wise God our Savior be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forevermore. Amen.